just by a show of hands, how many of you like are a fan of sushi? Yeah, so I kind of figured. <laughs> so what if I told you, even if your sushi looked a lot like this, in reality, it might look like this. Like, those are all plastic bags and trash. So this is along the same lines of what Paige's um, presentation was. Um, I'm more for a good uh, focusing on what happens in the ocean after it actually gets there. And I'm also going to be focusing more on like, the plastic waste rather than the biodegradable things, because that's really what's the biggest problem in the ocean right now. So, um, so basically the first question is why should you care? Like, other than the fact that your sushi might not be exactly as clean as you think it is. Um, well, plastics, baking in the sun, I know a lot of you have heard that you shouldn't leave your water bottle in your car on like a sunny day. Well, in Portland, that's a little more rare, I guess. But uh, Back home, my mom always used to tell me, don't leave your water bottle in the car, don't refill your water bottle with all the plastic, you're going to get cancer, da -da -da -da. typical things that moms do, just kind of like nagging you. But after a little more research, I found out that plastics sitting in the sun actually do tend to break down slightly more, and it leads to the release of chemicals. Um, an example of this is bisphenol A, or BPA. It's actually found in most manu or a lot of manufactured plastics, and it's been labeled as a toxic substance in Canada as of 2010. Yes. Um, Canada and the European Union have ba banned BPA in the production of baby bottles because it has been shown to affect fetuses, young children, and infants. So, um, next thing is that it kills marine animals. Like as you can see, like this turtle also got caught in this. Uh, uh, I believe you all recognize it as a six-pack holder for like soda. And, uh, just like in the tortoise in Paige's presentation, this one couldn't get out of it and its body just had to kind of grow with it. So, as you can see, there's probably definitely internal well, mixing up of the organs. So, this is bad. And plastics getting into the food chain and actually ending up in our stomachs as well. As you can see, this is a small fish caught off the coast. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's at least 10 pieces of plastic in its stomach. And even just by the ratio of like the size, like how much plastic the fish ate to how big it is, imagine like a tuna or a mahi mahi, which is close to, you know, like, I want to say at least five or six times that size, possibly 10. Um, so there's, in the North Pacific, there's a North Pacific gyre. And that's actually a vortex of currents, and it is swirling into, uh, it's pulling all the trash that floats into the Pacific into like, this giant garbage patch, or as they, Captain Charles Moore named it, uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And estimates have been anywhere from 10% of the size of Texas to as, they said, like, as big as the United States or as big as France. Uh, I just wanted to put it in perspective, like, the most popular are the most, let's see, most places where I read, they said that it was twice the size of Texas, so I put that in relation to Hawaii, and as you can see, it covers not only the main islands, but it stretches out into, you see this dark area? These are all also islands, like they include Midway Atoll, which is a bird sanctuary, and it's affecting the trash that's gathering in the Pacific is actually washing up on beaches and affecting animals there. So despite the fact that these birds are supposed to be protected, they're still being affected by human trash. Um, again, the, the worst part of it is that it's made of plastic. Plastic doesn't generally decompose. Uh, it can take anywhere from 450 to 500 years, depending on the size of a plastic bottle, just for that to decompose. And imagine just how many plastic bottles we go through on campus here. Like, and then try extrapolate that into in the country, in the world, all of that. And all of the, most of it is coming into the ocean. So this is a picture of the gyres. That's the North Pacific gyre where the Great, garbage, or Great Pacific garbage patch is. 
And there's also actually collections of trash in the Atlantic Ocean uh, up here. So it is it is a growing problem. It's not just isolated to one ocean. There's all over the place. Just runoff, people just being careless, dropping things all over the place. So this is Midway Atoll. As you can see, these are not, these haven't been toyed with or manipulated. These are how the studies actually found these birds. So as you can see, the entire, pretty much the entire rib cage is full of plastic trash. And once these birds ingest it, they can't, they don't, they can't digest it, they can't pass it through their system, and generally they can't throw it up. Because as you can see, they eat objects as big as like pens, bottle caps. Bottle caps are really popular. And then this turtle actually died of, I believe it was a suffocation or it just ate too much plastic bags. Sea turtles actually are known for mistaking plastic bags, like Ziploc bags, for jellyfish, which is their main source of food. So once a turtle starts eating that, it gets stuck in its throat, it can drown. And this one just washed up on the shore, I believe it was in Hawaii. Um, there's a bird out there that has a rubber band stuck around its neck, and it clo actually, if it's tight enough, it'll close its throat, so it can, it'll starve to death, because, simply because it can't fit food, or swallow its food. It's, I had a video of a bird feeding its young, and actually it has a fishing line stuck in its throat. And the way birds feed it, their young is they'll eat something and basically throw it back up into the baby's mouth, which sounds disgusting, but it's kind of necessary because they don't have hands to carry the food. So basically, this fishing line is stuck in its throat and it's trying to feed its baby, but the baby gets caught on the line as well. We're here next to a blackfoot albatross that. Uh has a piece of fishing line down its throat that it's fed to its baby. And the baby has swallowed it and, and the mother can't get it out of her mouth and so they're connected by this horrible piece of fishing line now. So we're going to uh, attempt to pull it out of both of them. So sweetie, why don't you go ahead and, and get her wings. Make it a, just a quick motion. Just go. Big hug. Okay, sweetie. Oh, that didn't work. There it comes. There we go. Another one, this is more close to home for me, this is um, on the Big Island of Hawaii, this is Camilo Beach. Uh, it's pretty, pretty much not your typical idea of a beach in Hawaii, I guess, pretty much the opposite. Uh, the Big Island is well known for its lava rock beaches, and most of them are really pristine, it's beautiful. Black sand beaches, like clean, like warm water, but this is pretty much the exact opposite of that. Camilo Beach has gone through numerous individual and organized beef cleanups. Um, to date, I believe they've taken at least uh, I think one one such cleanup was, happened in 2006 by the Boy Wildlife Fund and they actually removed about 10 tons of trash and about 200 trash bags of plastic. So uh, it has been it has been a slow journey to recovery but it has been getting better. So this is kind of just an example of how people can. It's not a. It's not an irreversible process. Like we can still fix it. We just need to do our part. Um, 
called Restoration Efforts. Uh, Charles, Captain Charles Moore, the discoverer of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, actually started the Algalita Marine Research Foundation, and this is their boat. Uh, they've actually gone on numerous uh, attempts to clean up patches of the or parts of the Great Garbage Patch. Uh, this is difficult because most of the pieces are uh, yeah, about that big, and pretty much the only nets that can strain it are gonna catch fish, plankton. It's gonna pretty much wreck the ecosystem too, because plankton is pretty much the base of life. Pretty much small fish eat plankton, bigger fish eat that. Grows on it, grows on it. And the only way they can really effectively clean out these plastics is what's called manta trawling. And basically, they just pull this at the um, from the back of a ship. Uh, this is a fine mesh net, but like I said again. You can't control what you catch. You're gonna catch fish. You're gonna catch. Uh, uh, you're gonna catch plankton. You're gonna catch fish. You're gonna catch plastic. But uh, it's kind of at random. There's also the project Kaisid. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization devoted to increasing awareness. And they often go out on uh, just offshore to take samples and kind of educate people. Uh, here you can see there's a monk seal caught in netting, just drifting on the ocean. That's another problem that uh, arises when you have bunches of trash and it just gets tangled, it just creates a huge mess. And also, the, again, Hawaii Wildlife Fund, that's more for... They concentrate more on native species in Hawaii, like such as the Hawaii monk seal, a uh, whole new green sea, t uh, green sea turtle, um, protecting animals like Personal responsibility. Uh, Portland's a, Portland and Oregon are a great place. They highly emphasize recycling, taking care of your trash properly. Um, it's our duty to keep additional plastics from getting to the ocean because 60 to 80 percent originates from land. It's not just thrown off boats or ships. Like, it does come from us, so we really have a part to play in this. So basically, I'll just leave you with a thought. Do you want your beach to look like this when you go on vacation? Or would you rather go to a place like this?